Hello, and welcome to day two of our great art escape here at the Toledo Museum of Art inside the Glass Pavilion Hot Shop. My name is Joe, I will be your narrator and storyteller. This is Colin, you will be the gaffer, and over to our far, far, that would be your left mind, right, is Mara. She's going to be assisting Colin today. Now, Colin's going to be doing an old fable called The Fly in the Soup. And just to start that off a little bit, once upon a time there was a fly. And she was flying around and really, really, really exhausted. She couldn't find anything to eat. And she landed on a pebble. She tried it. She didn't like the taste of the pebble. Then she flew up, landed on a blade of grass, didn't enjoy it at all. So she's flying around and she thought to herself, boy, I would really like to eat something today. And then she finally smells a beautiful smell. Flies over to a house where there's a cracked window and sees a gigantic bowl of soup which is where we will begin now. It's just like making a bowl of soup. We have to start with the basis consistencies. In this case, our crock pot, which will be our furnace over to the left of your doing, my right. Uh, that is rocking at 2,150 degrees Fahrenheit. And that has about well, 600 pounds of pure glass. In this case, it would be our rock of our soup. Colin's doing a gather. As you can see, it's glowing this brilliant, brilliant orange. Now that glass is 100% crystal clear. It's just at this temperature, it radiates this beautiful orange color, very similar to lava. Uh, we're pretty much playing with lava all day, and it is awesome. And he's going to take this, and he's going to make it into this beautiful cauldron with a little bit of soup in it, and then, of course, a lot. Now, this beginning process that he's doing, is he waiting for that glass to chill out a lot, so that way we can do more glass. We can radiate into that pipe and really make it hard for us to come close to that glass. So he's chilling off that pipe, trying not to go too close to the glass because then of course it can pull too much heat to bounce above the metal. Now that he has that, he's coming over to our location where we have some frit. Now, what is frit? Frit is just glass color. Uh, very similar to a bar of color, but it's just broken up chunks. You can see how that's printed and speckled all throughout. We also can do various other forms where we have a powder or just a solid bar of color. Powder is going with the color black. This is a, I think this is a F2, a nice standard print. He's going to really try to saturate that because this is going to be the building blocks of our fly that he's going to start hot stuff. Now, he has to keep entering it inside of this reaping chamber. His glass still likes sitting at that really nice temperature of about close to 2,000 degrees. So he keeps re entering it, and he wants to be sure not to leave it in there too long because it gets to the point where it gets really inconsistent and we can't control it, uh, which Colin's not going to have a problem with because he's been blowing glass for a very long time. He wants to melt that print into that clear glass, covering up that clear glass to give the illusion that it is a solid uh, black color throughout this entire piece. I think he's going to collect maybe just a little bit more, and that's going to create that saturation to be really, really nice on that fly. Going back to the story of the fly and the soup. The fly sees the soup and thinks, boy, I would really like to try some of that soup. In her case, it was broccoli and cheddar soup. Because from the oldest woman to the biggest socks to the littlest fly, everyone loves broccoli and cheddar soup. It's delicious. So she calmly flies up, and she realizes she cannot lift up a spoon to get the taste. She goes, oh no, that's a troubling cause. She tries the fork, cannot lift it up. She's too small. So she does the next logical thing, and climbs on the end of the bowl of soup, leans over, and tries to get some but she can't. So she jumps in to try to get some of the soup with the lead. Now, going back to Colin, he's got his saturation up high enough in his color that he's happy. So now he's rolling it, and he's using that tool that we have. That is just newspaper, that is waterlogged. Uh, what ends up happening is if something's waterlogged enough, we can rely on the lake, laden frost effect, and what that is is that creates a barrier in between the water, it is something that's superheated. 
uh, very similar to a frying pan that's very hot when you throw water and it spins around in the beat instead of turning instantly into gas. That's exactly what we're doing with this. He's going in, grabbing his newspaper. And this is about as close as he can physically come to touching that glass. He's coming in with his jacks and he's doing a slight compression halfway up. This will start forming the body of the fly. Now that tool that he just used, that's very niche. That's very uh, custom only to glass blowing. Now he's got that shape and he's going to slowly reheat this back up because it's cooled down and he's probably going to work a little bit more on uh, shaping that head of that fly. Now, you'll notice that column is turning really, really slow left, and then it'll uh, switch back and start turning really slow to the right. Uh, he's doing that so that way that glass can stay balanced. The main reason is, is because if you're working with a bunch of different colors, there is a chance that they can actually twist up and cause patterns that you don't want to have happen. In this case, we're just using all one color, but it's still a very good practice to turn one way and then turn back. Now Colin is formed in this, he's taking his diamond shears and he's clamping down uh, in between the glass that's on the pipe that we call the moil and the glass that's on the outside, which will become his fly. After get working that in, now he's going to start, I do believe he's going to start torching and start shaping this up into a really, really nice uh, form. Mara and him were just discussing some additional things that they can do. Once again, he's pulling it out of that region chamber. Using the back part, the patch, as we call it, of his jacks in order to form this really nice uh, fly body. Pushing it back, making it stout. Going back on with his jacks, just to kind of balance that out. You'll notice he is still constantly turning because this glass is still super heated to the point, very similar to the And now, Mara is going to be bringing in the addition of the eyes to the fly. In this case, the eyes are going to be red lipstick, a very gorgeous shade of red. We can show you the body. The beginning processes of our fly. And then much like gentle coats of this because this is a much smaller grip which will create a nice little density when she does place it onto that uh, uh, black color. It will give a nice uh, circular shade of that red to give the illusion of a fly's eyes. Going back in. They're just communicating on how to apply these. Colin wants to make sure his glass is pretty hot. He doesn't want it to be the point where it's actually super pliable. Because glass will only stick to other hot glass. Otherwise, we'll put these eyes on and they will pop right off. Looking at his form, deciding on where he wants to put these eyes. Virus inside of our other reheat chamber over here to my left, your right. Both reheat chambers are playing at 2,150 degrees. I think that'd be 1178 Celsius, or if you're a chemist, 905 degrees Kelvin. Rolling it into a really nice point, because when she places this on, it's gonna be very similar to like a taffy. Uh, very melty, you just glob on, very satisfying. She's trying to stand out of her way. We'll bring it over and then hold it up. Um, sticking it on. Very nice. And going in for the second. Very good. And now we have the blobs of glass that we will soon uh, turn into the eyes. Back to our fly story. So, 
our fly, she's very hungry, and she has landed inside of her soup, this broccoli and cheddar soup. She starts to indulge in it. She's like, boy, this is the best thing I've ever had. She consumes and consumes, of course, getting her vegetables too. But then after she has her fill, she's like, oh, well, it's time for me to go away. But alas, the soup is too thick, and she, her wings cannot pull her out of the soup. So she starts struggling, and she's sticking in her head, oh no, whatever shall I do? She's incorporated in a struggle. Unlike, or very similar to glass blowing, we are in a constant struggle too. This glass, we don't want to make sure it gets too cold. So if it gets too cold, then obviously it can, just, it can stress out, crack. So he's still balancing it. You can see how it still has that gorgeous red glow. Uh, of course, the eyes are going to have it because we used that red color for the eyes. And then black color, since it's such a dark color, very similar to on a hot summer day. You're going to work. You're going to want to wear a white shirt rather than a black shirt. This is going to keep you about five degrees cooler. In this case, black is a very soft color. It works very hot and it holds in a lot of heat. Colin, using our torch just to melt in those eyes just a little bit. Laura's getting ready. I think she's grabbing up some more glass for the wings of this fine fly, this hungry fly. Still trying to control this. Doing a little bit of slight shaping with his tweezers. That tool is just some really big tweezers. Very similar to something you would have at home. Just to pull out, like, simple like hair or something like that. This will be fun because now they're doing the application of the wings. Now, uh, glass, anytime we have it heated, it wants to stay in a ball or a spherical shape. So, Mara is going to be pointing this up, and then when we place it onto this fly, it's going to be a ball, which Colin is going to have very limited time to actually manipulate and pull this out and create these uh, fly wings. Big enough to support the weight of the fly. Mara is just heating this up, getting it to a proper consistency, balancing it out. Glass blowing is very much a team sport. Colin calling the shots and then the assistant is always trying to make sure that the glass is at appropriate temperature. Going in, dropping down. He wants to be quite precise though. Ooh, he's elongating. Very nice. Very nice. We wanted to take off some extra material. Sometimes when you put it on, it's better to go in and get a repeat rather than spend time cutting it off. This is the problem solving that comes with glass work. Going in with his shears, doing some light snips. Now he has the separation. Going in gently with his tweezers. That was really cool. I think that looks so cute. Very good. It's always fun to watch this because sometimes, you know, uh, you're not really sure what it's going to end up looking like, but that is an outrageously cute plot. Now he has the process of the fly done. So, he's just going to finish doing some tiny, like, little perfectionist work, the tinker work, if you will, just cleaning up some spots because it is glass. So, of course, if we do not actually melt in the sharp bits and points after it hardens, it will become very sharp. So, now that he has that balance, he's going to place this inside of our bike hole and make sure that it just sits in there happily. And then we're going to start making the poultry part of the story, including the soup as well. Look at that block. That's awesome. Very good. So now, the next step, of course, is he's going to have to actually gather up another form of color to make this color. And how Colin's going to do it, this time he's going to do his blowpipe in order to pick it up. 
just going to do a small dab of glass, then he's going to make a collar. Because inside of one of our annealers over there, there's actually a little bar of color that he's going to pick up. Like I said before, he was using a print for the fly body. He's going to be picking up a piece of bar, which is very similar to a bar that I'm holding. So in the process of making a bar, he wants to make a collar or something that we can grab the glass and it will stick to the pipe. Now that annealing oven that he has over there is only at 920 degrees. And going from 920 degrees Fahrenheit to 2150 degrees Fahrenheit, there is a chance that it could actually crack the glass. But Colin's been doing this long enough where he feels content and confident enough to pull off this. Got that collar made gorgeously even, giving that quick boost of heat. And he's going to go over and pick up his bar. Setting it inside, tapping it gently against the glass. And picks up his bar with color. He wants to be sure to stick it in there quite fast because it can lose a lot of that heat very, very fast. So now that he has that in there, he doesn't want to make it super hot right away because there could be some sort of a tarnishment that's left on that glass that we call kiln dust or kiln wash just to protect the glass from being stuck to the ceramics that are inside of our viewing. Now, did you already dust it off? Yes. Now that he's dusted off the little bit of kiln wash that he had, he can actually start melting and shaking his color. You can see how already it's starting to get a gorgeous red tone to it. Sticking his tweezers and centering his little piece of bar. And he just told me it's a really soft color, which in glass terms just means that it can hold heat very, very well. And it can be expanded very, very easily. Now, there are different forms of uh, glass color. One is also known as uh, Dorian, D-O-R color. Grand. Also part of Duro, thank you. I always get those two words confused. But Duro is a super, super densely compact glass color. That's not ideal for blowing because it's just so hard. Actually, if you just take the Spanish translation of that word, it actually translates over perfectly to hard. This color, excellent for glass blowing. Excellent for just blowing out of form to make a really gorgeous thing. Colin's going to be making his vessel. He's got that super hot, and he's going to start forming into this uh, bullet slash uh, Q-tip shape, which is kind of a, about 99% of glass blowing, and how it's pretty much done by doing that shape. See how he's got that? He's going to roll it on our marker, which is just carbon steel, shaping that glass nicely, cooling down the back first. Pressing it in, he wants no lines in this because glass has a fun thing where anytime you gather more glass onto it, there's a little tiny line, a bubble, a scratch, a divot, it's going to collect even more bubbles. There are some glass blowers who love bubbles, but let's be real, most of us do not like them at all. It's very hard to keep them uniform. You want one bubble, and that's in the very center of the piece that Colin is working on right now. It's going back on to Marbury. At this point, it should be soft enough where he has that bow pipe completely covered. Now that he has that covered, we can just try to finish up a little finesse the shape before he goes in back into our furnace to gather up more glass. See how he's going through that very, very uniform, straight shape. This ensures that there will be no bubbles that get trapped onto it. That, that gorgeous color. And that is the color that it should look like in the end. Because I do believe that this is a very black ultramy color. Very, very nice. So now Colin's going to wait a little while. The main reason is because now, if he introduces that into our furnace, that color gets too hot. What's going to happen is some of that color might get a little too melty, slip off, fall into our furnace, which would be a big no-no. But you waited long enough where you felt confident in it, sticking it in, rotating, and then pulling out a huge 
blob of glass. Which then he's going to come over to his bench and he's going to use one of our favorite tools, which is called the block. It is carved out of a block of cherry wood. Any kind of fruit wood would work very hackable for this. You could even use a drum. Anything that's high in water saturation and very, very low in sap content. And as long as column keeps turning, that wood will never be burnt out. Creates a nice little layer. You can see that steam coming off. Quick rotations make it so that way we can ensure that this will last for many years. Now, we're going to start inflating this by doing what's called the blow and cap. Colin's going to get this super hot again because he's got that outside gather of glass that's at 2,150 degrees. And then he's got that little bar of color that's on the inside. That's probably chilled out an awful lot. But he cooled it using the block and pushing that heat back into that color. And now he's reheating the whole entire piece to try to balance and homogenize it as evenly as he possibly can. One more roll on the block just to make sure that that outside is nice and uh, stiffened. Then he's going to introduce some air. Then you can see as the air hits it, it'll slowly start to expand out. Just like that. No struggle at all. Unlike our fly. We have a question. Go. Oh, yes, question. How did, how did you learn how to blow, blow glass? Uh, me, or should I be asking Colin? Either. Yeah. Uh, I learned how to blow glass because I attended uh, EGSU, which is a university very close to Toledo, and they actually offer a glass blower program. Uh, I took it completely. Uh, for an extracurricular, and then it ended up becoming my obsession. Everything I ever wanted. Colin decided to go to, it was Jackson University? Jackson. In Florida. Jacksonville University of Florida, which he chose to specifically choose last floor because he has very fond memories of going, coming up to Toledo when he was a child, visiting his grandparents, and then coming and actually seeing last floor demonstrations live. And then Mara, she chose it because she went to Ohio State University, which has a very good glass blowing program as well. Glass kind of chooses you. But now that Colin has that, he doesn't have the struggle, he's going over to his barber once again to chill it because he wants to make this cauldron really, really nice and big. And at this point, he could make probably an okay shaped cauldron, but let's be real, everybody wants to see something just a little bit bigger which is no struggle, like back to our fly. So she's trapped, she's stuck on this delicious uh, soup of cheddar and broccoli. She's thinking to herself, how can I get out of this? She tries to climb over to the brim of the bowl. She tries to attach onto it, but she can't. The soup, the water tension is just too strong and it's got her in place. So she's starting to worry and she's starting to panic. But just before she thinks it might be all at a loss, she hears a man's voice ch chant out really loud, oh my goodness, there's a fly in my suit. Unlike that fly, Calvin has got a huge gather of soup all to it now that he can really start working with really, really well. Now, he's rocking right now at probably somewhere about five pounds. And as he holds the pipe farther and farther back, that can increase how much the weight actually is. Anytime we gather, we're effectively doubling the weight. Uh, sometimes it can be as heavy as about two, two pounds, one kilogram. Then we go in and we gather, and it turns into four pounds, or two kilograms. It's just a very good rule of thumb to always think every time we gather, we double it in weight. That's why we also have another form of gathering called a strip gather, where we drip some of the excess glass off, just so that way we can control it a little bit better. This colony has a bubble inside of this. He also has that very soft color, which could easily come to form if he has it too super heated. It's going back in, and then now we're going to start blowing out this cauldron. Now, Colin's going to be kind of a, at a little bit of a battle. So I don't care how long you've been blowing glass, it's always still a battle on the blowpipe and the glass right next to it. It's very hard to strain and elongate out that glass because it's, of course, pulls. 
the last thing that goes into the roofing chamber and the first thing that comes out. It's also having the temperature pulled out of it from that low point. So Colin's going to be using his paper to cool off the back end, using his thumb and his fingers to cradle that glass and start inflating it. So he inflates it, and the first place that the, or that the air is going to go to is wherever it's hottest. It's going to expand out. Now he's going to do that a couple more times. The reason is, it's because it's always nice to be safe in the families. Going on this one? Right. Next, he's going on to the marble. And for this, what he's going to be doing is he's going to be chilling that bottom and inflating it out. This is doing essentially the same thing that he was doing with the paper, only to more of an extreme level. So he's going to use the weight of his glass to actually be held down and elongated. Once he rolls that, cooling down that bottom. Then he's going to place it off the barber, slowly inflating. He doesn't want to inflate too much. Then he's going to go back and roll it. Once again, cooling that bottom. It's unlike ceramics. We're not working from the bottom up. We're actually working from the top down. Meaning, the top of that piece is located right by his bullpen. Now that he's got that nice and shaped up, he can actually start blowing at the bench. Or, if he wants to, he can actually elongate it even more by using the barber. It's one of those things where it's kind of up to the gaffer. He's the guy who's in charge. Choosing to go back to the bench, grabbing this newspaper, and once again, using that. Now, you've noticed that out of all the tools we mentioned, He's pretty much only used his jacks and his newspaper. With just those two tools, you can essentially make almost anything. Those are the two best tools. And the good news is, one's newspaper, so it's very important. Colin's using that little block of beeswax just to lubricate his blades, because even though this is glass, it's glass on steel. So it'll make a high pitch sound, very similar to the dentist's office. Some people don't like it, but it doesn't bother me that much. Blowing, using the patch of that, just to cool down the bottom part of that cauldron. Now, interesting thing. Uh, this looks like this is completely coated in color. Uh, that's the optics of glass. This is only about maybe 10% of actual glass color. But since it's pushed so close to that clear outside wall, it looks very, very large. And as he inflates this, you'll actually see it become almost a complete color of that beautiful black that he's using. Let's open up the side door here, just to get that piece in. Holding it up at an angle to kind of squat it a little bit. Now he has this bell shape. Holding it back down to kind of stretch it from the neck. Rolling it on that newspaper. You notice his turning, it's always very fluid. And then when he stops to turn the other way, his hand with the newspaper will twist or move in some slight pattern. So that way, there's never a given time where the paper itself is directly against the glass. And move just like that. Any kind of tarnishment on the glass, it's really, really hard, especially once it's been burnt in. So, once again, this is the perfection part. Uh, we understand that we're glass blowers, and we want it to be looked like it was made out of a machine. That, right now, looks like it was made by a machine. Introducing a little bit of additional things. Now we're going to start communicating the next steps that they have for this culture. Turning this side of the roofing chamber become very difficult. 
once again using gravity as his belly. And you can see how we went from that squat shape to now this elongated, almost uh, teardrop shape. It's really trying to balance out that glass and pull from that middle. Trying to make it look as nice and as even as possible. Another question. How is Colin able to hold that pipe without wearing gloves? Very good question indeed. Uh, you might have noticed, like uh, the observer noticed, uh, none of us are wearing gloves. I'm wearing a protective sleeve and so is Colin. Uh, that the main reason is, is because us as glass blowers, we can actually feel uh, the glass through the pipe. That stainless steel pipe that's welded to a mild steel end, it's about six inches at the end. Stainless steel, a very, very small, if you were to magnify it a couple thousand times, it's very zigzaggy. Unlike copper, which if that was copper, you would not be able to touch it. But that heat only pretty much resides in that really tarnished area. That's not a patina. That's that uh, actual breakdown of that metal. So as long as his hands stay where it's shiny and nice, he should be okay. And without the gloves, it makes it where we can feel that glass inside the reaping chamber. I've met a few people who actually do wear gloves, but nine times out of ten, it's because they're actually allergic to stainless steel. It causes them to get uh, itchy hands, which is a big no -no. Very good question. Keep them coming. We love answering this. Now, Colin's going back in to finish up this uh, very, very nice shape. He's still going for this cauldron shape, so he's probably pushing down right now, trying to really blow out that very midsection. Also, it's going to create it to round out very, very nicely. Using the torch that is rocking at a nice 3,000 degrees, it's targeting on the very bottom of this piece. Uh, it's not going to hurt you as the viewers, but you can see that giant yellow flame that's kind of hitting that glass. That's called sodium flare. We do make special glasses that actually block away from that because that can be decently harmful. Uh, the glasses that I'm wearing are didymium, which actually pulls away that heavy yellow color. They make it where I can actually look directly at that. And you can see the glass itself melting rather than that huge scope of that yellow tint really torching down that bottom, making sure it's super hot. And then you'll notice Laura, she's only going in for these quick little about five to seven second long flashes. And that's just hot enough to make sure that that back end stays nice and happy. Colin's taking his tweezers and he's slowly starting to open this. All you do is you push the tweezers in, release them, and the spring naturally starts to elongate and open it. However, depending on how thick the piece is, this might take two or three tries. You don't want to rush it, because if you rush it too fast, what's going to happen is you'll push the glass inside of the piece, and it gets really difficult to actually work with the pliability of the piece. Going back in with the tweezers. And he has it opened. Really. From here, they're going to probably switch pretty soon with Laura. And then what they're going to decide to do is that they're going for a really, really nice uh, crown funnel to actually connect and transfer this off. And Laura's just eyeballing it, so now way she knows what to make. One thing about glass blowing. So a little bit of eyeballing will actually go a long way. But back to our story about our fly. She's still in the suit. And she just heard a man walk in. And she's thinking to herself, boy, I would love to see my family again. I don't want to be in the suit anymore. I've got my nourishment. I'm ready to travel. I'm ready to leave. And then she hears the footsteps come closer, which of course brings her some slight fear. She doesn't know what this is. To her, it's just this giant. Walk. He walks up and then he says very loudly, oh my goodness, there's a fly in my suit. So he picks up the spoon that she was too weak to pick up and gently scoops her up 
and it places her onto the windowsill. Why he did that? A great gesture of kindness amongst the biggest giants to even the smallest things. Well, we the big giants. Mara's over here making this giant globe hunting. What that is, is she just has it open. So in that way, if she needs to, her or Colin needs to, they can actually inflate out this message. Just doing some quick eyeballing. You can see that. Mara's going to cool down her pipe because once they transfer this, uh, those pipes can get very, very hot. Especially when you open up both of these doors, like what Colin is enduring right now. When those two doors are closed, standing in front of this is only about 90 degrees. Now, it's like 120, 130 degrees. And that heat travels up that pipe because there's nothing blocking it in. Mara is ready with her punching. Colin is just flashing. They want to make sure these are both balanced. So if they are not balanced enough, the connection will go wrong. And we will do what we call a floor model. Grabbing the pipe gently, lining up, pushing up, twisting, creating a gorgeous airtight seal, and then centering. By rotating these pipes, we can make it so it stays perfect. Normally, that could be a time of concern. Uh, but Colin's been blowing glass for six years. He's pretty much got a really good feeling for when the glass is going to be looking good. It's safe for Mara. Now he's using his tweezers that he just dumped in that water. And he put it against that hot glass that was on the end of that blow pipe to evaporate it off. So that way when he stuck it back inside of the glass piece, a little bead of uh, water doesn't fall inside the vessel. Because if you do that, then you take it back in the reheat chamber. That water is spinning around, weakening that glass. And it's possible to cause it just to break off inside of the reheat chamber. See that turn? Still really, really nice. That crown funny is very gorgeous and still on center. He's targeting that heat. See how he doesn't have the whole piece in? just has it about halfway in because he's going to start a lot or enlarging that uh, outside but well, once was the shoulder or the neck into the lip. Long piece, especially this one. He took that down to about 1300 degrees which is danger zone when it comes to glass. Now you can see that heat, how much he's built up into that. We're going in gently with his jacks and then Mara being a buddy Kind of blocking that heat from the skin, that soft tissue. Sliding back and forth, just to make it a little bit bigger. Then he's going in and chilling off that midsection with that paper. What he's probably going to do next is going to heat it up. Then he's going to insert the soviet, which is just a little puffer that he can inflate it from another end. Still is doing those heavy targeted heats. Because this cauldron is going to be gorgeous. Got that. Comes back on. There is the Soviet. Placing it in, blowing very hard, and pushing it against that glass to inflate out that lip area. Going back on with the newspaper. Because we still have to inflate this out just a slight bit more. It's looking like a cauldron. Now, in addition to that Sophiette, another tool that he will probably be using very, very soon here is the addition of this flat paddle. This is just to cool off the lip. It's a metal. What what Mara was using is actually a cherry paddle. That actually does good by not taking a lot of heat out. Now, as it's forming this lip, he's going to want to start to cool it off. So if it gets too hot, if he actually starts spinning really, really fast, what's going to end up happening? It's going to end up all that uh, centrifugal force. It's going to actually elongate it out to the point where he will not be able to control it. All right. 
over here getting ready. Another punching class. I, I was incorrect. She is getting ready to make the soup. Everyone's favorite soup. Cheddar and broccoli. Or in this case, I think it's going to be pea soup because I see a gorgeous Granny Smith apple cream that is sitting out. Outstanding color. Now you can see how he's forming that into that gorgeous golden shape. Over the lip. I think this is going to be the final shape for his culture. She's going to walk up and show you guys in a moment. Showing that off. I'm going to show it to the people who want to see. Ah, just a little bit of fine tuning when it comes to the look of the piece. Uh, there's many different styles that Colin can go for when it comes to finishing the look of this piece. Widening up that lip just a little bit, and then flattening it out with his jacks. Very nice to look Now, Mara is still getting ready. She's collecting a large amount of glass. She's going to coat it in that beautiful green. She's letting that chill out, as you can see on her pipe right now. Oh, it still has that very heavy orange color. Same thing happens if we try to gather clear over clear as it does if we're trying to do color and then clear coated it. That clear can get too hot and actually fall off, thusly making the gather of glass almost essentially worthless. Also trapping bubbles, which is another thing that I mentioned. We do not like bubbles. She's going in. She's going to do her gather and cool that off on the pipe cooler. Joe, we have another question. Yes, I love questions. How hot are the torches? How hot are the torches particularly? This torch right here, it's a regular Ranger. That rocks anywhere between 3,000 and 3,500. That puppy torch can range in a couple of different temperatures, anywhere from 1,500 all the way up to 2,000. Uh, the reason why we prefer the fluffy is because it does a lot more surface area. That's totally the that. This ranger is very, very small. It only has about like seven openings that blow out that heat. So it works really well for targeted heats, but not for all over consistent heat. Very good question. Awesome. So, Mara has finally added up her color. She's just finishing melting that in. She wants to make sure this is really dense. We wanted to give it a nice soup tone. Rotating it in the It's like a giant orchestra of chaos. But it's very controlled. Colin's going in and he's finishing up the shape. And from what I know now, they're going to place this on top of the cauldron, creating almost essentially a beautiful cap. You can see as he's chilling out that green, that green is really starting become visually apparent. Mara keeps bringing it out so that way Colin can have all the shape of this. It's very important that they get this very, very close. This glass isn't one of those things where you get two tries. It's one try and then that's it. I think that's why a lot of people find this uh, form of uh, uh, art is such a gorgeous and fun medium. It comes with a lot of challenges. Also comes with perfect timing of two people working together. She's getting that molten super hot. Now Colin is going to attach this. Sets that on nicely, gorgeous, boom. 
just like that. Using these jacks. thing about it being teamwork, even though I'm there ready, this hand is so close to that home rock glass. I tried to grab something in order to protect it. Even though you have one job, sometimes you want to protect your friend, especially since that glass. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, it always is very, very sensitive or very painful. All that sensitive tissue on your palms, inside your core, and that soft gutter tissue in your tricep. Now that palm's got this in its cauldron. It's going to start shaping it. So in that way, this soup looks like it's overflowing out of this culture. Very, very fun. And then what they're going to do is they're going to start bringing up heat on that fly. So in that way, we can put this together. Since we're at this part, I'm going to tell the entire story again. So once upon a time, there was this fly. She's flying around. She's very, very hungry. She's looking around. She can't find anything to eat. She lands on a pebble, tastes it, does it. It's not to her liking. Flies over, lands on a piece of grass. It's not to her pleasure. So then she goes, boy, I'm just so hungry, and I wish I could find something to eat. Starts flying. And she gets captivated with this gorgeous smell. She flies into this house where there's a window open. And after she flies in, she discovers this great poultry of this delicious soup broccoli and cheddar soup. She goes, man, I would love to try. So she flies down. She tries to grab a spoon, but she's too weak. She cannot pick it up. She grabs the fork, but she's, too, she's just not strong enough. So she comes up with a better idea, and she literally plunges into the soup. She jumps into the soup, thusly taking in and eating as much as she can, but she's trapped. She gets worried that she'll never be able to get out. And then she hears a man's voice. She just starts panicking because here's this great giant walking into her while she's trapped inside of this delicious soup. She's helpless. She can't get out. And then the man just utters, oh, there's a fly in my soup. Grabs the spoon for which she was too weak to pick up, scoops her out, and sets her gently on the windowsill, thusly showing that nice acts of kindness can always happen. We're right here, how is finishing. And now we have the fly on the culture and the soup. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start flashing this down. So there's a bunch of different temperatures all throughout this piece. It's going crazy. He's got that top hat. Not that top hat. That top piece of that soup is completely solid on top of glass. That is probably only about maybe half a centimeter thick. And then he has that gorgeous fly resting on top of that soup. He's just trying to melt in the little punty mark that was left. Now Mara is over getting dressed up in a heat retended attire. Very fashionable and very good. Because what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take this glass and rest it inside of our Our are at 920 degrees. And over the next 24 hours, this will drop down to a new temperature. The reason why that is needed is because all these different thicknesses of glass are going to be cooling at different times. We want the outside temperature of the glass and the innermost inside temperature of the glass to be about roughly 3 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit apart. Anything more than that, and you could run into some serious stress pressure, especially with something like this, where the thickest part is definitely that fly. Look at how gorgeous that is. That is just a lot of fun. I'm going to force you to answer it. Now that he's doing these controlled lashes, he's getting it nice and balanced. He wants to make sure all of it has a slight orange glow to it. So in that way, he knows that everything's at a very exact temperature. This is the one time where we actually use our eyes and not our hands 
tell our different temperatures of oh, this class. Jack's on the line right now. Yes. No problem. Got it. Right now, cut up here. These are protective suits. Catch you We're going to use a little bit of vibration onto this. And then these jacks just to add a little separation. Just like that, we got it broken off. Let me run over here to the left side. Opening it up, throwing it inside of the annealer for safety. Just like that. And now we can give a gorgeous round of applause for Colin and Mara for that awesome demonstration. Very outstanding. So, the moral of this story of the fly in the suit is just because you're scared of something doesn't mean that there's not good things that will always happen to you. No matter what, you're drawn. Even in your pursuits of glass, you can always have good intentions that will always be brought out to everyone else. Thank you so much for tuning into our demonstration today. We will be having another one in about an hour, and that will be for belling of the cat. Other than that, is there any more questions on my mission? No. Thank you guys so much for tuning in here to the Toledo Museum of Art inside the Glass Pavilion during our great art escape. Hope you guys have a good day, and I hope you guys come back to enjoy the rest of the demos we have this evening and this week.